Steve Blank is a serial entrepreneur and, in short, a change maker. He is a retired eight-time serial entrepreneur turned educator and author, and has changed how startups are built and how entrepreneurship is taught around the world. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Startup Owner's Manual, and his earlier seminal work, The Four Steps to the Epiphany, and is credited with starting the Lean Startup Movement. Steve developed the Lean Launchpad, a hands-on class that integrates business model design and customer development, concepts about which he has written, into practice. Steve is a prolific writer, speaker, and teacher. Len Lodish, host of this fireside chat with Steve Blank, is the Samuel R. Harrell Emeritus Professor in the Marketing Department of the Wharton School. In addition to founding several ventures, Len is also the founder and practice leader of the Wharton Global Consulting Practicum. He was also the first Vice Dean for Wharton Social Impact. Len initiated, developed, and has taught Wharton's Entrepreneurial Marketing MBA course, and is the author of Entrepreneurial Marketing, Lessons from Wharton's Pioneering MBA course. He has published over 60 articles, is active as an editor in leading marketing and management science journals, and is senior advisor to Wharton's academic incubator, the Venture Initiation Program. So, I'm gonna start off with a, a few questions, but I don't think I wanna go for as long as Irina wants me to go, and I'm running this, so I think there's a lot of very good entrepreneurs in this audience, and a lot of people who have asked me very good questions over the time that I've been advising entrepreneurial programs. And what I'd like to do is make sure that you get plenty of time to ask questions of, of Steve. I'll ask you, though, as I'm asking mine, if you're thinking of your questions, try to think of questions that will be not only a benefit to you, but a benefit to lots of people. So don't make them as specific to a single industry or something like that, but talk about methodology or something that's a little bit more generable, generalizable so it will be valuable for a lot of the people in the room. See if you could tap Len's questions. Yeah, okay. Okay, I read through um, Steve's latest book and I was struck by a lot of the phenomenon that he describes and then he describes um, procedures to basically mitigate those phenomena. And most of the phenomenon, I looked at it and said, those are risks that the venture has. And then what he does is he recommends procedures to mitigate those risks. And I guess my first question would be, if you had to try to quantify the biggest risks in terms of what are the phenomenon that can really mess up the value of a startup? That's a great, what, qu that's a great question. Okay, what are the biggest ones? And then the next question is going to be, what are the most useful techniques to mitigate each one of those risks? And I think if you answer both of those, you'll have given a good summary of your book. Great. I, I think that's an excellent question. And, um, you, you know, I was uh, an eight-time uh, serial entrepreneur. Um, which is my wife said, because I couldn't get it right the first couple of times. Um, and, and, but, I, but I think the, the mistake most entrepreneurs make is um, believing they're visionaries and not realizing they're hallucinating. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and getting caught up in your own reality distortion field. And the actual um, result of that is you assume as a founder of a company that your passion for solving a particular problem means that it's shared by anybody else outside your building. It's a big idea. Um, I believe, I think this is a problem, let me go code, I'll let you know when I'm done, can you give me a half a million bucks? Right? But it's, so not only do founders fall into the trap of believing they understand a customer problem or need, but actually believing they understand how to solve it without ever getting outside the building. Um, and, you know, we now have a set of shorthand phrases to make that point, which says, you know, while you might be the smartest person in the building, there's no possible way then you're smarter than the collective intelligence of your potential customers. That's a big idea. 
Um, and therefore, we kind of translate that to there are no facts inside the building, so get the hell outside. Um, and this, the answer to how you mitigate this is um, over the last couple of years, we've evolved a process called the Lean Startup. Uh, based on some of my work, Eric Reese's work, Alexander Osterwalder's work, which basically said, look, for the last hundred years, business schools, Harvard, Wharton, school down south, starts with an S, you know, have, have all, in fact, been building a management stack for execution. Great strategy, great tactics, great, you know, operations theory, et cetera. But that management stack has been essentially focused on how to execute a known business model. But there's been very little data on, well, what if you do if you're two guys or women in a garage and that you don't have a known business model, you have a series of unknowns. What kind of tools or strategies do I use for that? And that really didn't exist when I was an entrepreneur. So we've decided to build one. And that management stack is that follows. So it's th just three components. So Lean Startup is just three easy pieces. One is, let's in fact kind of deconstruct your business into a series of untested hypotheses. While you might believe they're facts, I believe they're just hypotheses. And by the way, I use the word hypotheses at both Wharton and Stanford because you're paying $50,000 a year. <laughs> um, but outside of your schools, uh, anybody know what the word hypotheses means? Guesses. You're just guessing. So most of your businesses are a series of untested guesses. So why don't we use what's called the business model canvas, Osterwalter's work, to actually articulate what they are. And now we're going to do something radical, particularly if you're a business school student. We're actually going to get you outside the classroom and your building and actually go test those hypotheses in the real world. And there's a whole process of hypothesis testing that's kind of formalized called the customer development process. And that was my contribution. And the third piece, which was Eric Reese's observation, is we now know how to build products incrementally and iteratively with agile engineering. And we could build these things called minimum viable products, MVPs, which instead of building the entire product like we used to do in the 20th century and then ship it, you know, first customer ship and then launch it and then finally discover that no one actually cares other than your mother, um, <laughs> maybe, you know, if she could understand what you're doing, um, we'll, we could actually find out early and often. And so to answer your question, Len, which I thought was dead on, the biggest problem of a founder is not anything technical, but confusing your passion with facts. So on day one, an early stage venture is a faith-based enterprise. It's a religious activity that you very quickly need to turn into facts. And big idea two is we now have a formal methodology to kind of reduce those risks by actually showing you and telling you how you could do that, how you could reduce risks in a pretty rapid fashion. Did I answer your question? Okay. Are there other elements of the business model that also have risks that I know you talk about, how would you, how would you rate the amount of risk of some of those others compared to? Such as, what do you, what do you have? Well, to? pricing, channels of distribution, ah, thank you. Um, execution risk. Right. Um, the, Got it. Okay. All right. So if you really think about, let's go back to, I said we use a business model canvas to kind of articulate what all the hypotheses are. Um, any of you ever see the Osterwalder's business model canvas at all? All right, some of you. You should all download it. It's free. It's a good, good, biased book. It had, has lots of pictures, which is why I like it. But Osterwalder has figured out how to describe what a business model is in one picture. And he says in one picture, any business, whether it's your startup or the largest company in the U.S., can be defined as having nine components. What product or service are you offering? He calls it the value proposition. Who you're offering it to, who cares, your customer segments. What's the distribution channel? How are you creating demand? You know, what's the revenue model versus, meaning the revenue strategy and pricing tactics? Um, what are the activities you need to do? Software engineering, manufacturing, you know, FDA approval. What resources do you need to carry out those activities? Do you need any partners? And what are your costs? On day one, you gotta worry about all those things. For most companies outside of life sciences, for a second, the stuff on the right is the most important. And there are two that if you don't get past, you don't have a business. And that's what are you building and for who? And do they care? And those two have a special name called product market fit. And you, so you spend a lot of time at first going, 
so do people who actually care about the stuff on my website or a piece of hardware or whatever? And if they do, who are they? What's the archetype? You know, how much will they pay? What do they do? What's the process in selling them? And then all the other pieces uh, fall into place. Um, how do I get, keep, and grow customers? And that is, how do I create demand? Uh, um, how do I keep them? What does churn look like in retention? And then grow customers, upsell, cross-sell, next sell, et cetera. Um, and then what, what's the right channel, right um, revenue strategy? That is, in my licensing? Is it a subscription service? Is it direct sale? And then what's my pricing tactic? Gee, I need to take into account competitors in the industry, et cetera. And then kind of the left side is a supporting business. By the way, if you're in the life sciences, it turns out the left side is just as important as the right side of the business model, meaning in, in the therapeutics and diagnostics and devices, you have to worry about regulation, reimbursement, clinical trials, intellectual property, which may not be the most important things in a web or mobile uh, application, but are killer in, in life science applications. Did I answer your question? Or did I answer some other question? Well, no, you, you answered the question. Um, how would you, is there a magnitude of the importance of all of those business model decisions versus what you're calling the product market fit, which really comes back to the uh, customer development process that you started off with. So, you know, this is an iterative and recursive process. So you could start with, um, and, and it really depends on how you build your business. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, we tend to start with, I invented a technology, let's go find a set of customers. And their other school of thought is there's design thinking, which says, let's go spend some time understanding customer needs, and then we'll go invent some technology. And the question is, which one is correct? And the answer is yes. Um, is that you could come at this from multiple ways. Silicon Valley was built with scientists and engineers having you know, technology and process improvements and hiring guys like me that says, I don't know what to do with it, you go figure it out. And we kind of did. But there are other smart people like Procter & Gamble came up with Swiffer and others by understanding customer needs and then building technology to fit them. There is no right way, but it all converges on that product market fit. Um, what we teach, and actually we teach a formal class in doing this capstone class in the schools I teach at, is that we make our students get out of the building and speak to 100 customers, partners, you know, et cetera, in 10 weeks, 10 to 15 customers and partners a week. And, and boy, once you have 100 interactions, I'll contend you're starting to have enough data to see a pattern, and even then you need to keep going. But you can't do this saying, well, I spoke to three people. Um, there's just not enough data. And so what you're trying to do is kind of enrich the, the, the matrix of, of data points so you can actually start making some decisions. And, and by the way, if you're building enterprise software, you know, getting five companies to say, I'm willing to commit to a million bucks, you've got enough data. But if you were building a web mobile device and, or a web mobile app and told me you have you know, five orders, I'd be laughing hysterically. I mean, you're off by a, probably a factor of 100, if not 1,000, in having enough data points to have a scalable business. Does that make sense? OK. And if I'm looking at it a different way, I see that the product market fit is the crucial decision. And if that isn't made right, right. All, all the other ones don't matter. For everything but life sciences. And in life sciences, it turns out um, you could uh, get confused. So in life sciences, so for example, uh, anybody have a grandparent or parent with an artificial hip or some artificial whatever? Right. So are you all sitting up front? Is that? Uh, um, so who's the customer for that artificial device? Your parent? The insurance company? The doctor? Who else? The hospital? Who else? The insurance company? Yeah. The FDA? Right? Can't can't put it in. The answer is yes to all, but like if and but if you don't understand that for some devices you know, there are multiple customer segments and you need to understand which ones you need to go after first. And if you don't understand, you need IP, meaning freedom to operate. If you don't understand the difference between a 510K and PMA, and if you don't understand where reimbursement's coming from, it, all on the left side of the canvas. So you can have product market fit, but you might not have a commercial business. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but most web, mobile, Silicon Valley stuff, yes, it's all about product market fit. But you just got to be careful when you look at that business model canvas going, which business am I in? And uh, 
it kind of matters. Okay. In a different area, um, I get lots of questions, and I'm sure you do too, from people wanting to raise money, and when can they raise decent amounts of money at different valuations? And one of the things that I've observed, and I'd like to get your reaction to it, and then ask you a question, is that venture capital isn't so much venture anymore. They're looking for projectable returns, and they're really not taking as many risks as they used to want to take. And in order to be attractive as a funding source at reasonable evaluations, I find that if you can show cost of customer acquisition that's scalable and replicable, and then the value of those customers in terms of, as you, determine, you describe it, how much you make from those people over the lifetime, that makes sense. And you can show that if I only had $3 million or $10 million, I would have X more customers at this price, and the whole thing works. The, the question is, how do you demonstrate that replicability and scalability? So, so let me first answer a question that you didn't ask, which, uh, and, and then I'll answer yours. <laughs> which, but no, 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 because it just reminded me. It took me 20 years to realize. Any VCs in this room? Hey, come on, you can raise your hand. All right. They're not all sitting in the back, are they really? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, all right, keep your hands up. Everybody talk to them at the end of the, right? Uh, so, um, you know, I, it took me 20 years to realize VCs aren't interested in building companies. Um, if, if your goal is, inter if your interest as an entrepreneur is building a company you're running for the next 20 or 30 years, that's, that's not the interest of your investors. Your investors are interested in getting an obscene return right. within the lifetime of their, of, of their fund. That's not the same as having funding you to have a nice lifestyle or even impressive company that grows over 20 years to 50 million bucks. Why? Because they have lots of other choices. Um, and, and so they're looking for liquidity events. Um, and, and more so now than ever, particularly that social media allows you to kind of get half a billion users with 30 people and flip it to Facebook for $16 billion. I mean, that giant sucking sound you hear is all that capital going to that, that space. Um, that's different from an entrepreneur who wants to build a long-term business. The second, now to answer your question, there's been some real structural changes in um, venture capital. I, I was just talking to someone, as a, I, I ran to entrepreneur, what are you doing? I'm trying to get a seed round, and great, how much are you raising? Two and a half million dollars. Now, none of you are laughing, but that used to be a series A. I mean, a series, you know, now it's a seed round. Um, so uh, the whole game of, of venture funding is now there's enough, this valley at least, is a wash in enough capital that if you could fog a mirror, you could raise half a million dollars. And probably if you can't even fog a mirror, you could probably raise half a million. We should try that as an experiment and <laughs> pick, pick somebody who died and try, you know, put together a, a, a portfolio for them. But um, um, and so that's kind of changed the game. And, and the other thing that's changed is the exits. Um, it used to be that in the last century, the liquidity event was an IPO. You went public to get additional capital for your company to stay in business as an independent concern and to provide liquidity for your investors as an exit. Nowadays, and this is a big idea, innovation tends to die a little death because you're acquired in an M&A transaction and most of your companies won't survive that ca corporate capture. Um, maybe some of your technology will, but the odds are you're gonna be starting another company when your lockup is gone after a year. And that's actually not great for the American economy. Um, might be great for the acquirers, but it means your company is not gonna be the next HP or Sun or Microsoft or, or f even Facebook or Google or Apple. Did I answer any of your question or did I answer one I liked? Okay, no, that, you answered one you liked. <laughs> But how do you demonstrate? Oh, great, thank you. All right. <laughs> no, this is why we're going to have fun. Um, so one of the things um, I, I tend to think about that we now know how to do is what I call evidence-based entrepreneurship. Um, and evidence. Oh, boy, is he good with words. Right. That's good. And, and so you know, venture pitches and even you know, startup pitches are Essentially, let me tell you about my Wharton degree and how smart I am. And here's my, and, and here's my neat idea. Now, 
by the way, some of you might be doing more than that, but typically the pitches are, and here's my idea where it is right now. Okay, so now I gotta evaluate where you are right now, and if I'm just seeing you for the first time, you got about the first five minutes to get my attention. Maybe the idea is great, or you invented anti-gravity or something else. Now imagine you come in and say, you know, let me tell you what my idea was when I started nine months ago or a year ago. Great. Well, that's kind of vaguely interesting. But here's what happened after I talked to 35 people. Whoa, that's kind of interesting. Because here's what I found out, and when we tried this prototype, we learned X. Oh, now you got me a little more. Now I put down the iPhone, and I'm kind of paying attention. So was that your idea? No, because then we spoke to another 175 customers and built a minimum viable product, got it out, and got people to start paying for it. And here's what we found out. Wow, that's kind of interesting. But you know what? They taught us that we really should be charging this way. Holy cow. We've spoken to over 250 people. We've gotten, you know, 12,000 people on our website or whatever. Here's what we learned, and we're here to scale the company. Now, you tell me which one's going to get attention. It doesn't mean that you're right, but a lessons learned, evidence-based, you know, I've been collecting data presentation because it's not your opinion, because every VC, you know, works with the golden rule. They have the gold, and they make the rules. Um, and, and, and therefore, your opinion is always going to lose to their opinion. But once you make it a fact-based conversation rather than a faith-based conversation, and even better, an evidence-based conversation, now we could talk about whether we agree whether your evidence is valid or not and whether you were testing the right things. But we've now raised the game for everybody. You're starting to de-risk a potential investment because you're starting to answer the questions that t traditionally a seed round would cost a couple hundred thousand or a million dollars to answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we now have that process. We now, now know how to do that process cheaply and inexpensively. In fact, you should all be doing it and shame of you if you're not. Um, and, and by the way, the incubator demo days are in fact uh, destructive because they manage to make entrepreneurs parade around in virtual bathing suits and about who has the best font in their you know, presentation and the loudest voice, but with no evidence showing you here's where you are in, in a point of time. I want to know what you learned because that also tells me your velocity and trajectory of learning as a team. Is that and, and I think actually that a lot of funders, at least the people I see both in the VC community and in the angel community, are actually taking to heart exactly what you said, and they won't listen to a speculative presentation that's not evidence-based, and they're looking for evidence. Right. And, and uh, your ability to gather ed evidence is incredibly stupidly simple. I mean, you should all be thinking about, oh, how can I go run a series of low-cost experiments built around, again, this idea of minimum viable products? And you know what, what we never wanted to admit is we made a mistake. I think, in fact, pivots, which is you know, a substantive change to your business model, actually is a sign of intelligence. And the lack of it is a sign of a lack of intelligence, is that you're actually learning by going from small experiment to small experiment. And instead of blowing their money at the end, you're learning rapidly, and you're converging on a potential solution. Let me ask one more question, then I'd like to turn it over to the audience. And the concept of minimum viable product, I had one issue with a few of my uh, people I'm advising, when if that minimum viable product is out there and people, it, it's out there in the public, yep. and it can be uh, social media, you know, can. Yep. If it isn't good enough right. to delight people enough, it, and it, your name is associated with it, that could be the end of that product prematurely, and you won't be able to pivot if it's not good. So what is the real, uh, or what, how would you advise somebody in terms of what the level is for minimum and minimum right. viable? Product? So there's a, that's a great question, because I, I get it all the time. and. Um, there's a couple of I implicit conclusions in that, in that question. Uh, one is that anybody but you actually knows about your product. That is, and, and, and let me start with the, with the simplest one. 
A minimum viable product is not a smaller version of your large product. It's not a defeatured version. A minimum viable product is whatever gets you the most learning at the point of time you are at your company. Let me give you a specific example. I had some students who took my class, then you know, six months later call me up, Professor Blank, we're raising 100 grand to do a drone uh, for agriculture. Well, what are you building? Well, we're gonna build a drone, we're gonna put a hyperspectral scanner on it, we're gonna fly it around farm fields in California, and we're gonna be able to tell by plant which plants need water and nutrients right now? California's in a huge drought. This should be a killer, blah, blah, blah. How much are you raising? $100,000. I went, let's see. You could do your MVP for $1.25. Professor Blank, you didn't understand. We need a drone. We need to rent the camera. We, you know, explaining it to the old guy. He just didn't, maybe his hearing isn't any good. You know? I said, no, you don't understand. And we went back and forth, and finally I said, What's your business? And they said, Professor Mike, drone, camera, what? I said, no, what business are you in? Anybody understand the difference? What business are they in? Say it again. What kind of information? Uh, to who? Farmers. Did it require a drone? Does it require a drone? Not to mock up the first version of the product. You, in fact, it doesn't even require real data. It requires you like hacking you know, a little spreadsheet and walking up to a farmer and saying, if I could give you this resolution data, would you pay for it? And like you could just hear silence on the other end. I said, right now, that's your first MVP. You guys are engineers and you want to go play with the drone and the camera, and I understand. And they were, by the way. And you know what they found out? They actually did that. And then they discovered, and this is why MVPs are great, and then I'm going to answer your question. Do you know what flies over farm fields? There are 5,000 of these in the United States. What already flies over farm fields? Any farmers? Crop dusters. Crop dusters. A fancy word, aerial applicators. But that's how we spray chemicals on farm fields. There are 5,000 of these planes in the United States. And they approached the aerial applicators who said, we'd be happy to bolt hyperspectral cameras on our planes, and we'll be happy to be a distribution channel for you. <laughs> so now, all of a sudden, instead of we're in the drone business, we're in the data for farmers business. And my point is, is that an MVP might be at some time a drone with a camera, but, you need, but it will change over time. It might be simply, what do I need to get people to push the I'm interested button on my website? Oh, I got to build the whole site, it's particularly if you're a software engineer as a co-founder. Oh, I got to build the whole site and the code has to be good. Give me, prove to me you could get them to, uh, to push the red button that says I, I'm interested in this problem. Because if you can't get them there, the rest of the site really doesn't matter, does it? Um, so all of a sudden, the MVP is what matters. So let's say you now kind of do this, and now back to your question, oh, what if I put this out and everybody will know and it'll ruin my reputation? Somehow you're all confusing. Who has ever asked the question? You think you're Apple. No one knows who you are. No, seriously, no one cares. Somehow you're thinking that there's investigative journalism in this business. No, there really isn't. So if you're a large corporation, this is a valid question. If you're a startup, you've confused an MVP with a product launch. No one is suggesting an MVP is a launch. An MVP is you're going to find some places to test it. Do you know where people test now, or before Apple just made it easier? Tested uh, iPhone apps? Any idea? Anybody testing iPhone apps? Where do you test it? New Zealand. Put your stuff in the New Zealand app store, and no one in the US knows. Or it cares. <laughs> Seriously, it's an English market. You get to test. You get to see if it breaks, etc. When I used to do this in the old days before the web, I'd always launch my products in Japan. Right? No one in the U.S. at the time could read Japanese, but the Japanese would read U.S. stuff. But you know what? I would like find out all kinds of stuff about my products. It's really easy once you kind of like think that no one is actually going to know about you. That matters. And the other one is confusing an MVP with like you declaring it's a finished product. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Um. <laughs> All right. That's as good as I could say. Right. You, want to open it up for questions? Yes. Or you gotta, yes. Okay. No. Let's okay. let's open it up. And we've got. I saw someone has. Um, and somebody asked me something about pivots. We didn't talk about pivots. Yeah. But you can ask anything, and I'll answer it about pivots. Alicia, <laughs> do you want to ask James? Do you want this?
We only have one person with walking around with a mic. We need to we maybe have two. Have... I'm here, but Jane is on the other side. She's just making her way. If you so can stand up. We'll do one side and then the other. Yeah, we can do that. So stand up to and ask, why don't you hand it to the next person who's going to talk so we could kind of ping pong. Yeah. I wonder if you could say a word or two about how some of these strategies and techniques apply to uh, businesses like crowdfunding, which is hot right now, where maybe a critical mass is necessary yep. before you can get so more crowdfunding, feedback. Kickstarter, etc. So, great question. In fact, I grappled with this for a while. Is gee, is crowdfunding a kind of substitute for customer discovery or a cheap hack to get to customer discovery? And the answer is no. But but let me give you the the uh, the subtle part. It turns out customer discovery has four steps, and two of them are in the search mode. The first one is customer discovery, where you test your hypotheses. If you crowdfund, the minute you put up something on crowdfunding, you have to deliver what you just said you're going to put up. There's a second part of customer discovery, which is called customer validation. I think I understand all my customers, et cetera. Let me see if I could get an early order. Crowdfunding is actually great for customer validation. will put you out of business in customer discovery. Because the minute you say, I'm crowdfunded, you have just stopped your ability to learn past that spec you've just put up. It, so it doesn't mean don't do it. It just means you have to say, Steve, we've been doing discovery for six months. I kind of really understand customer needs or whatever. Let's see if we can get some orders. Great. OK, great. Does that make sense or not? I knew you were going to ask me if I answered your, if you answered my question. No, I really don't care. You answered a fantastic question, uh, but I, I want to tweak it a little bit. Yes. For stuff like a crowdfunding platform or other uh, ERP, other things where you need a critical mass before you know if you're addressing a true so, need? So there's a lot of stuff like that require network effects. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, so in multi-sided markets, let's just take Google search, right? You've got users and payers, but you know how do you get the payers before you get the users? And there are some markets where you understand, gee, if I get 20 million users, I'll figure out monetization later. In fact, that's how venture capital works. And, and, that, and by the way, the scale of that number goes up like a factor of something every year about how many you need. Um, so in, in some multi-sided markets, you make the bet that, you know, yes, if I can you know, double down on the, on the user growth, that I'll figure out the monetization later. And that's why it's venture capital, because there's risk of whether there's a monetization strategy. Um, in others, you might actually want to test some of the monetization strategies, but you still want to double down on the other side of the market. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Arun. Um, I hope I'm invited to the professor after party. This is a great discussion. Uh, I was wondering, <laughs> when you said, uh, when you talked about asking, you know, getting more, like the evidence-based entrepreneurship idea, and you talked about talking to people, you know, I was kind of curious, are, how much of this is, is it enough for, for entrepreneurs to go and talk to people and kind of, you know, talk to 100 people or, you know, whatever the number is, or how much actual, you know, data do you need in, in terms of, like, surveys and things like that? So how, how much, what, what's the... So, th so this is a great question about, is, and let me make sure I understand. It's the distinction about whether you physically got to um, watch their pupils dilate versus a survey monkey. Is that... that great. So, um, you know, I struggled with this as an entrepreneur myself, and I'm just going to tell you my experience. And it seems to be borne out by, by the data we now have. I think there's a hierarchy of the quality of data that you get, all the way from doing surveys. Anybody fill out a survey? Anybody, right, online? Anybody ever tell the truth? Okay. You know, it's kind of like, unless you have cross-correlation to that data, it's kind of like the, the halftime score is three. Well, three to what? So I kind of think there's survey data, there's email data, there's telephone data, there's video Skype data, and then there's I'm watching your pupils dilate and you look at your watch data. Um, the, when we make our students go out, the only things that count are eyeball to eyeball, and if you can't do that, video Skype. Why? Because it's the quality of, were they saying yes, but like doing their email? Or were they like leaning over the table engaged as you were now telling them something that really got their attention? Um, does that help? Yep. And by the way, it doesn't mean, by the way, it doesn't mean don't do survey data. But once you have that um, 
correlation with the eyeball data. Now the survey data can be correlated with, well, how does that correspond? And let me just take one other uh, 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 shot at this. Anybody in market research firms here? I, I want to be careful. Um, so uh, don't take this personally. Um, but at least for startups, market research firms are awesome at predicting the past. Um, <laughs> if, if they were great at predicting the future, they'd be running hedge funds. So it's not that I don't want market research data. I love research data. But you're the ones inventing the future. It's a big idea. So I, I use it to kind of set the benchmark because I want to understand the universe. But you know, any great Wharton student could sit in the uh, business school library, knock out a historically great looking business plan based on market research data. It's not even worth the paper it's printed on because you have no facts. The facts are outside the building. Um, and that's, that's my experience. Um, and, and that's why, you know, having, when you do this in corporations, gee, I've now had name of huge consulting firm, you know, do the $10 million report for me. Very rarely does it correspond to actually what you find outside. We kind of have a phrase in, in startup land that says, no business plan survives first contact with customers. And the reason we know that now is that a business plan makes all the sense in the world in a large corporation when there's a series of knowns. But in a startup, you're actually trying to forecast a series of unknowns. And the only people to require a five-year plan for a series of unknowns are venture capitalists in the old Soviet Union. Um, and we know how well that turned out. Um, sorry. Let, let me um, take a different point of view. I think it depends on what the product offering bundle is. Because if you can't, at scale, talk to people about your product and look into their eyes, but the way they're going to be exposed to it is, say, on their phone or on the web, you need to have them exposed sure. to it in the same way. But instead of asking them market research, asking them things like getting orders. Absolutely. OK. Completely so. agree. Jump in and ask that pivot question. Steve, you asked about asking a pivot question. So this term is used a lot and used differently. Some folks refer to pivot as small changes. And some refer to pivot as basically fundamental shifts. It's a different business, effectively. How do you define pivot? Right. And, and, and you know, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so the way I, I define a pivot is in the context of the Lean Startup. If you remember, Lean Startup, Business Model Canvas, Customer Development, Agile Engineering. A minor change to one of the components of the business model, minor change might be your pricing went from $4.99 to $9.99. Or you know, your customer segment went from men 14 to 18 to women 14 to 18. That's an iteration. You've iterated part of the business model. I define a pivot as a substantive change to one or more of the business model canvas components. What's a substantive change? Your pricing's the same, but it's now a subscription model versus direct sales. Your customer segment went from urban youth to you know, middle-aged women in the, in the Midwest because you discovered a new archetype. Um, and so a pivot is actually derived from learning from a series of experiments you've run outside the building. I've done some A-B testing, or I've gone out of the building. And in the old days, here's how we used to pivot. You ready? You know how we used to pivot? It's a great story. You've lived this one. So in a startup in the old days, you would you know, kind of like build the product with waterfall development. That is, you'd spec it, and you'd build it for a year. And then you'd go alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. And you'd have a first board meeting after your product launch, and everybody would be high-fiving the VP of marketing. And then six weeks later, you'd have another uh, board meeting. And finally, the you know, board would turn to the VP of sales and go, how are we doing per plan? And your VP of sales would say, great pipeline. <laughs> now, only half of you are laughing. You could explain it to the other half. It meant, we're not making plan, but we're going to be good. And that repeats for another couple of board meetings until one day you walk into the boardroom and somehow no one is sitting next to the VP of sales. You don't know how they arrange that, but no one wants to sit next to the VP of sales because the next time the board says, how we doing? And he says, pipeline, puff, cloud of smoke, pile of ashes, and a new VP of sales just automatically appears. And she goes, what a stupid strategy that one was. What did she just do? Pivot. Pivot. 
we used to pivot by firing executives. Because, by the way, we have, this process would repeat, and when sales still wasn't good, who got fired next? VP of marketing, of course, right? Somebody's lived this. And finally, the founder. <laughs> and finally, a year later, you're out of cash, or almost out of cash, you shoot the founder, who's the acting CEO, or, or promote him or her to chief strategy officer or something. Each, each time you were doing that, you were pivoting. Startups went, always went from failure to failure, but rather than saying the plan was incorrect, we always blamed it on an operational executive failure. The whole idea about the lean startup is we now embrace the notion that startups learn rapidly, inexpensively, and cheaply by going from failure to failure and doing pivots without bl first blaming the exec. So instead of blaming the exec, we're firing the plan before we fire the people. Now obviously at times you might have the wrong people and we could talk about teams and whatever, but we now acknowledge that all we have is a series of hypotheses. So we'll, well, let's very rapidly you know, kind of change the, those assumptions. By the way, the downside of this is that some entrepreneurs confuse pivot with attention deficit disorder, but that's another discussion. All right, did I answer? Yeah. Why don't you state your name and what you do, too, just so Steve can have it in context. Hi, Steve. My name is Jesse Puji. Uh, I'm an alum, and I run a company that's about 100 people that we started about four years ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, um, <laughs> so <laughs> my question to you, you mentioned this, that you know, venture capital aren't focused on building an enduring business, a 20 to 30 or 50 year business. If that is what, as an entrepreneur, you're interested in, what's your advice as it relates to funding specifically, and then any other advice for how do you build oh, a company that will be around in 100 years? That's a great years? question. I mean, you know, in the old days, people used to build it out of their profits and earnings and, you know, uh, make self-sustaining businesses and bank loans and corporate partnerships and strategies and, you know, uh, you know debt. I mean, there are other, you guys have all been to Wharton, there are other financial vehicles to, to kind of do this. Venture capital is a new invention. I mean, you know, really took off and when we changed the tax laws and the pension fund laws in 1977 and 8. So it's a, you know, it's relatively new. The U.S. was great at building businesses beforehand. Just an easy source of capital. And, and by the way, when I say that, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a diss on venture capital, by the way. It's just that their business model is not, you know, they make money from, you know, maximizing their IRR which is maximum return in minimum time. So there are lots of, you know, that's what Wharton knows about is financial vehicles. Um, everything from bonds to something else. What other advice for long-term I'm sorry? What other advice Well, you know, if you're building an enduring business, you actually, um, and where are you building it physically? San Francisco. Yeah, then, then you are at a disadvantage. I was going to say, in any other part of the country, building an enduring business is, is actually um, great for uh, you know, talent retention, et cetera, when people know you're in it for the long haul. The problem here now is in Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley is now a state of mind rather than a physical place. It goes from San Jose, no, San Jose to San Francisco. Um, uh, you know, our game is innovation and entrepreneurship, but relentless churn. Um, of, of, and you have a, I don't know if you have a retention problem, but you're competing with lots of people wanting to move in and out. I guess my other advice would be, unless you don't have that problem, I'd be thinking about set, setting up your company for growth anywhere else in the world but here. Um, and, and I mean that not, not as a reflection on your company, but as a compliment to your company, but you're swimming upstream here with, with um, that kind of philosophy. Not that you're wrong, but um, uh, here it's, uh, it's transient, you know, effort and maximum effort for a short period of time. Um, that's what we do well. In fact, that is what what we know how to do is how to build uh, relentless and um, and agile organizations in in a very short period of time. Other question? Yeah. Hi, Steve. Uh, my name is Raj. I'm a prospective student. Um, and I just spent the last six weeks finding out that the initial idea for our startup failed first contact with customers. And my question is also around pivots. Um, 
if it's a series of hypotheses and guesses and you have limited time and runway, the question really is how do you know what the right next guess is? Especially if you have five or six on the table at a time that you're going to pivot and you're not sure which one to take. How do you know which, what's the right, right next guess? And are you talking about that you have five or six different businesses or five or six different customer segments or five, um, um, help me understand. Well, let's say you have an idea for a different product that could potentially solve the problem that you're looking at. There's another problem that your customers have talked about that you didn't initially think about, but you could try to tackle that. Or there's an adjacent market that you realized is potentially more attractive and easier to penetrate, and you could start there. Um, and those are probably three different types of ideas that you could have. Uh, great. No, no, keep going. And so now what's the question? So the question is, you don't have enough data today to make a decision about any of those because you haven't vetted them. If I don't have any decision today, I, I can only start working on one. Yeah. So are you Which passionate one do I work on? about any of them? Yes, but I was also passionate about the last one. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so I'm going to just do a riff. Thank you. And, and, yeah. and, um, so, so I'm going to give you the, both the good news and bad news. The bad news is there is no right answer. The, the good news, though, is what you just described is actually a conundrum for an entrepreneur and, and a good one, is that the, the mistake we made for, at least in teaching entrepreneurship for the last 50 years, is, is thinking that entrepreneurship was another profession like accounting. Um, if anybody noticed, accountants don't run startups. My apologies to any accountants in the room. Um, you know, but, but founders of companies, Founders of companies are closer to artists than any other profession. It's a big idea. That is, unless you're driven to create something out of nothing, that is to take your idea that's inside and actually make it visible and, and, and tangible, the first time the stuff hits the fan, you're going to think it's a job and you're going to go home. We, we hear the word resilient and tenacious about entrepreneurs. It's not a skill you kind of like, you know, check the box. It's driven because you're driven by the passion of wanting to create something. And some of you are nodding, so you know what I'm talking about. And the rest of you are not. You ought to be working for those people. <laughs> no, seriously. Because entrepreneurship is the most miserable job, job you could ever take. Most of you will fail. 90% of you will fail. If that scares you, then you shouldn't be in this because it's not a job. Entrepreneurship is an art. It, it is something you would do for free. And if that's not, and if you're doing it for the money or for the whatever, because it's cool, or your classmates are doing it, you're in the wrong business, my friend. Um, and I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about, to answer your question is, what in fact gets you up in the morning and goes, I can't wait to test X, or I want to solve what it, and you know what? That's the, that's the direction I would go. If you're not like, un, can't, can't believe that you could be an entrepreneur in this country and make money at it, they're like, holy cow, it's not a job. Um, and so, what I, and I didn't mean to diss accountants, but it is not like some, some job skill. It is a calling. If you're not called, to be an entrepreneur. If you can't think that this is what you want to do with your life, there's nothing wrong with this, be, with you, because entrepreneurship is for crazy people. <laughs> and if you don't think that matches who you are, don't do this because it's now the hot, cool, new thing. It's a crummy job. Does that make, what, you, oh, yeah. you were an entrepreneur, right? Is that what you, right? I agree. Right? <laughs> But actually, Len was a world-class entrepreneur and nailed it. But it was not like in the movies. You wake up, and you have a great idea, and you build a team, and you go, it never works like that. It, it's more like you know, you're know you nine months into it, and your co-founder just quit, and the toilet's backed up, and you're the head of facilities, and your best customer just told you they're not actually paying, and they've gone the other way, and you got like to make payroll next week. That's like a good day. And, 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 and if you're not up for that, right, you lived that for 20 years, right? Um, that's what I was a professor while I was doing yeah, it. Yeah, well, <laughs> so maybe that's the other thing. You have a paycheck while that's coming in. Well, that's right, right? absolutely. Um, so I didn't mean to riff on you, but it, it really is, 
you know, pick a passion for a direction. There's a, there's a tactic that I actually teach my students, and, and I'll just riff on this for 30 seconds, is that I tell them at first, when they're looking at a business model, particularly for customer segments, spend the first couple of weeks or months going broad. Look at a series of segments, get familiar with them, and then go deep. Pick one. Just pick one. Pick one you're passionate about or you think there's some early evidence and go deep. The odds are you're going to be wrong. But when you pop up again in three months or six months, you're going to have a lot more knowledge about then which ones to pick again because you've already done a preliminary survey and then you go deep again. So it's broad, deep, you know, broad, deep until you find a scalable one. Does that help? Yeah, and, and let me just add though, that I think it's actually in some of the chapters in Steve's book that you can, if you have a segment that you're passionate about, which is what it sounds as though you were doing, and you're trying to iterate on what is the product offering to solve a certain problem that the segment may or may not have, sit down with some people in that segment and go over all these problems and see which one of them they get their socks rolled up and down about and they get excited about. That's, that's great advice. Be because sometimes you'll find someone who says, you can't leave the room until you like, let me try the, you know, the, the, the beta. This is the most important thing I've ever heard of. And if you don't find any of those, it's also a sign that it's time to possibly pivot. Over here. Hello. Uh, my name is Kathy Sorabi. I'm an um, executive MBA student uh, currently at Wharton. I'm also working on a venture. Um, my question for you is related to something you briefly mentioned earlier, um, that is um, team formation. Any um, thoughts about, especially in the early stages of venture, um, how should one go about forming a team? You know, I, I got this wrong a lot, and now I see. You know, here's a scary statistic, and it's just a heuristic out of my students, but half of teams that form never even get to the seed round. Um, basically on, on team issues. Uh, this is the most stressful job you're ever going to have, and it's um, and, and figuring out how to relate w to each other under high pressure. Is, is that the type of question? Um, I now recommend um, students who are thinking about forming teams to at minimum do a, anybody know what a startup weekend is, right? It's a 54-hour kind of weekend. It's almost in every city in the world. Go take your team and go through that. And let me tell you, even in 54 hours, you will feel what, how people behave under, you know, like simulated pressure. And if they can't even, like, if, you, if the communication starts breaking down like that, basically I would, uh, I would trade off trust and reliability um, for intelligence, competence, or anything else. Um, because you could always hire team members who are great engineers or whatever, but for co-founders, you need to be able to trust them with your kids and your, you know, because you're trusting them with your, the next four years of your life. And you need to trust their ability to deliver what they say they're going to deliver. And, and probably I would put those as the two biggest things. Now, in hindsight, you know, I would trade off everything um, for that. But that's just my experience. Uh, well, I, you have? I would add commitment yeah. to the venture as the third. That's what reliability to me was. Yeah. Yeah, but yes. Does, does that answer your question? And, and, and there, I'm sure there's uh, some literature out there on how you can actually go test or find that or whether it's Briggs Meyer, I don't know. But um, you will be surprised that people you think you've known for years, you know, in an academic or, or school setting, when the stuff hits the fan, when that is when it's pressure to deliver or time or whatever, you know, they don't deliver. Um, and, and, you know, now you're like, wait a minute, this co-founder, we're all supposed to be carrying our weight, and you find out they might have family issues or other issues or whatever, all valid, but not, not finding it out now. You need to find it out early. Next question. Uh, yeah, my, <clears throat> my name is Sylvester Richmond, and I'm a prospective student, and I wanted to sort of... Uh, Best school on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Some of the best accountants I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so, so my question, I was really trying to get, um, dive a little deeper into the concept of uh, evidence-based entrepreneurship. Yep. 
uh, there was an article by Chris Anderson who, well, implicit in that is the idea of sort of the scientific method. And so uh, Chris Anderson wrote a, an article not too long ago saying that we have, there's the death of the scientific method in lieu of computational power. And the reason I'm bringing that up is when we talk about gaining evidence at scale, um, I wonder what your thought would be to, to, from tools like, uh, say, sentiment analysis, where you can tap into, say, the Twitter API and get evidence, you know, sentiment, mood scores, and sort of, sort of understand um, sort of a large base of what's going on around the world of a custom segment and how that may sort of relate to your, the product that you are trying to sort of test. Yes. No, yes. No, I, I agree. <laughs> um, meaning, um, but now seriously, so the answer is yes. Um, but um, what we have done is uh, uh, this process, this whole lean startup process, I've turned into a class at uh, a bunch of other schools. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the class was adopted by the National Science Foundation to commercialize all science in the United States. Um, my, it's called the Lean Launchpad when it's taught in schools. But at the NSF, it's called the Innovation Core. We've put over 325 teams of scientists and engineers uh, through the process. And uh, last week, it was adopted by the National Institute of Health uh, for commercializing all life sciences. We're going to start uh, that class in the fall. And then the DOE, Department of Energy, will be adopting it in the spring. And the reason why our federal research organizations have adopted this methodology is exactly the phrase they used. Um, they said, Steve, we think you've invented the scientific method for entrepreneurship. And I never would have made that claim. But um, now we have enough data and enough longitudinal studies just as an aside, for uh, it used to be that if you were a scientist uh, trying to apply for a, uh, a federal commercialization grant called an SBIR or STTR, your, uh, your success rate would be about 14% in a double-blind review of your, um, of your application. Um, I got a call a year ago that said, Steve, we'd, we needed to rethink your program. I said, what happened? They said, we started to look at the data. Well, uh-oh, this doesn't sound good. What, what's the story? Well, after 200 and some odd teams, uh, we analyzed the SBIR program and realized people who have taken your class um, are getting funded 68% of the time. Um, and I went, uh-oh. And they said, well, we've now made it mandatory for anybody in the, in the government applying for a, a SBIR grant. And, and I know it isn't exactly your, this is a higher level of scientific method. But yes, there's a bunch of big data out there now that could allow you to start looking at things you could never look at before. And so the Twitter API for sentiments are one. Um, you know, the, and I don't mean to be facetious, but the, you know, the irony is the NSA has actually pioneered sentiment analysis on a scale we never could have imagined. And it's, I'm surprised that no startup has ever reverse engineered well, wait a minute, you know, if they figured that out at this scale, what is it besides the Twitter API that we, we could do at this scale? Um, kind of interesting. I mean, you, um, because we could use, you know, Google AWS and, and other yep. cloud-based resources in a way we never could have afforded any of that hardware before. And so now uh, to do analysis at that scale, I'm just amazed that there aren't enough startups. Maybe they're all in hedge funds doing this, which they probably are, using you know a hundred million dollars of you know somebody else's servers to figure this out. So it's a smart question. I, I'm sorry I was glib. Actually, I'm not sorry I was glib, but I didn't mean to give you a glib answer. Uh, other question. Hello, uh, my name's Arjun Srinivas. Um, I run a uh, materials company here in the city. Uh, we're up to about 40 people now. Um, Early, earlier in the day or earlier in the night, you mentioned, um, you know, that companies today can come up with an idea, grow to 10, 20, 30 people, and get acquired for billions of dollars. In within, social media. In social media. So with, with those types of companies competing for venture dollars, um, there are you know, venture groups who were founded, who, who have some even have materials in their name or chemicals in their name, who have shifted and pivoted per se and, and, and are now focused on things like social media. Um, where do you see uh, venture capital going in, in areas that are outside of social, mobile, you Great know, question. gaming? What, what kind of materials? What are you making? Uh, electronic materials. Like what? Um, transparent uh, conductive materials. Graphene? 
like graphene, but but not. But, but better. But <laughs> no, no, no. But today, so <laughs> graphene will be great no, in like twenty years. Uh, the graphene's the technology of the future, always in the future, yeah. right? Um, so it's funny you ask that question because it's a real interesting one to me. Is that, uh, uh, and I'm going to give you the short answer and then maybe a little longer answer. So when we started this program with the National Science Foundation, now we have hundreds of teams um, getting funded in a process that I thought was actually interesting, but no matching venture capital that used to be there to catch them. And now that we're going to do it with life sciences as well, it was kind of interesting. So to make a long story short, the head of the uh, National Science Foundation SBIR program, Eero Arkelik, who started the program with me, resigned after his career at NSF and set up a venture fund in Berkeley to fund the output of the best science in the United States, including yours, whether it came from NSF or not. Full disclosure, I'm an investor in that fund. And there's a group of us who believe that, you know, thank you, social media is covered as well, and that there's a national interest in actually getting private capital into areas that no one's looking at. And so send me an email, and I'm happy to introduce you to Errol and his fund. Uh, and so the, so the bigger answer is, um, if you look at what we've done in the U.S., is historically, the U.S. invests about $125 billion a year in, um, in federal research, um, NSF, uh, NIH, et cetera. Um, research universities get you know, somewhere between 30 and $40 billion a year. State governments contribute a bunch. Um, but historically, venture capital f provided about 20 to $30 billion a year of funding of the kind of that output of technology from, from universities. And historically, what venture capital did was aligned with what the country's needs were. Um, it was, we funded hardware, we funded software, we funded life sciences, uh, because the returns were about even on all of them. And, and the real disparity has happened in the last five or maybe 10 years, where social media returns have been um, so large that venture capital funds have literally shut down life science investment, material science investment, et cetera, because that's where the money is. And that's kind of unaligned what the country was getting out of venture capital. And because we have no national venture capital policy, um, you know, that's made other countries more competitive in investing in future technologies. And a good number of us, including not only me and, and Errol, but I've been talking to the Office of Science, Tech, uh, Science, Technology, and Policy in Washington, that this is a real issue, and this is one of the reasons why they're encouraging this evidence-based entrepreneurship to at least make startups who, that are science-driven be able to talk the language of customers. And, and so there's kind of a ditch of death. If you were a scientist, you'd kind of stumble into a venture capital firm and wave your technology without being able to talk about what's the class of applications, what's the potential market size, et cetera. So we've now at least figured out how to get scientists to talk the language of private capital. It doesn't mean people will fund them, but we think we're, we're making that a little more effective. I, I hope I answered that. Yeah, and, and just, uh, I guess, one quick follow-up Oh, you get comment. two questions. Is that... Well, this is, this is more of a comment. So we actually uh, did go through the NSF uh, program. We didn't go through your training, unfortunately. It sounds like it would have been helpful, but, um, and actually, Joe Bordonia was one of our big supporters early on. So, uh, Great, also congratulations. Penn, Penn alumni. Hey, Steve. My name is Angela. I uh, just graduated from the program here two months, so it's taken me all this time to decompress and come back to campus. But I'm very thankful that we have Wharton here um, in San Francisco. So my question is actually more on scale mode. As you work with companies who are in their Series C or D stages, if and how do the nature of these tests change? And um, specifically, as they're moving away from early adopters into mass, like, can you give me specific examples of you know, it's a great things question. you've seen with those right. companies that you you um, you advise. So this whole lean startup stuff, you know, it looks like it's the focus on the front end. But if you read some of the stuff I've written, the four steps of the epiphany, there are really four steps, and the two in the back are about execution. And for everybody else in the room, I think I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to tell you a secret that no VC ever tells founders. There's a secret memo that VCs never give you. And, and it's the memo that happens once you succeed. And it's really kind of sad. So just imagine you're a world-class entrepreneur and you've now spent the first two years searching for a repeatable and scalable business model. By the way, 
Steve Blank's definition of a startup, and I, I will get to your, your question, is when I was an entrepreneur and somebody asked me what a startup was, I would say, well, it's a place where you bring your dog or you get free food or, you know, whatever, <laughs> or it's, you know, band of brothers or sisters. I mean, it's camaraderie. So I finally came up with a definition. Do you remember that Harvard definition of with resources beyond your control? Right, right, right. Everybody, right. So I came up with a more actionable one. So Steve Blank's definition of a startup is a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And if you parse that, that's kind of interesting. Because the objective of a startup is not to be a startup. Maybe obvious wasn't to me. There is no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There's a three-year-old startup attached to a seven-year-old failure that hasn't gotten the memo. Right? <laughs> and two is, you're searching for something. Well, you think your job is coding or getting orders or whatever, you're searching for the repeatable and scalable entire business model, product market fit, and what's the right channel, and what's the right pricing. And once you actually understand that and grok that, that sum, you kind of understand what your job is, at least in the beginning. Now let's answer your question. So it's now two years from now, you've actually found a repeatable model. You're actually, and how you know it's repeatable is you can actually hire, every time you hire a sales resource, sales goes up by one N, meaning you know, their expense time, and it's repeatable. It's not like they have to be marketing people, they're salespeople. You give them a price list, you give them you know, a, a sales strategy, they figure out how to do that. Congratulations, you're in scale. The day the founder finds that repeatable model, you're excited. Boy, wait till I tell my board, this thing's scaling, look at the numbers. And in fact, you look around at your company and you clear the papers out of the, you know, off the floor of the aisles because you think the parade will go around here. You hand out the confetti they're going to be throwing for your parade. You know, you have a wide lapel because that's where they'll pin the medal, you know, and, and you're, you have visions of being the founder who's now running a thousand person company. And so you go into your board meeting and going, it's scale, you know, we're going to be big and here's, and they're looking at you. And all of a sudden, they start glancing at each other. And one of the investors starts looking at you in a way that's making you personally uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. They're starting to look at you in a way they've never looked at you before. Because all you've said is, we found scale. And these have been your board for the last two or three years, thick and thin. You've been through 20 board meetings together. What do you think they're thinking? Who's next? I'm sorry? Who's next? Why? Because you're the idea guy, you're the artist, and now they need somebody to go and put that piece of art in. All but the I found the repeatable model. Why shouldn't I be able to run it? What don't I have? What do they think I don't have? Experience in what? Say it again. Execution. Execution. What was I just doing? Search. You were searching for a business model. Congratulations, you found one. Now all of a sudden, the company needs to go into a very different mode. And here's the secret memo. It turns out that if you actually, if I asked you to draw what happens from a startup, you'd say, oh, it goes from startup to big company. It turns out there's a secret mode in the middle. Startups actually go from search mode to build mode to execute mode. And in build mode, you know you're in build mode when you start writing the HR manual. Seriously. And when you start putting process in place, sales comp plans, start hiring departments and VPs and whatever. By the way, all companies need to go through that growth mode. But you were the one who was known as doing something crazy and flying to New York in a drop of a hat and calling on a customer in Tokyo by going there and telling them you were already in Tokyo. I mean, you were doing anything and everything. But they knew you was the crazy person. And so one of the Shakespearean tragedies of a early stage venture that's found scale is the, in the past, not so true some, some more, but you've got to be careful, is that your investors, they'd be worried about that you are now a potential liquidity event. And where before, what was your market cap really to them? Zero. Even though they gave you some valuation, you weren't worth anything because you hadn't found a repeatable model. Now, all of a sudden, they're looking at you as part of their IRR, their portfolio, and the any, only thing they want to do is screw that up. So they're looking to bring in the dreaded operating executive. Right? 
which might be you as Wharton graduates. Congratulations. <laughs> this might be your job. Right? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that except we forgot to tell the founder that that's the model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, it turns out that in the last five or 10 years, a lot more VCs have come out of startup roles. Not just operating roles, but the canonical model is Andreas and Hurwitz in Silicon Valley. These guys were true operators as, as um, entrepreneurs. They built startups, they built two of them, they built Netscape and um, Opsware, they went through good times and bad times, um, and, and they kind of knew what it is. And so the, the Valley also now has a different model that says, we're gonna pick and select founders who can actually be trained and grow from search to build to execute, and we're gonna bet on some of them. You know, one of the, my favorite ones is a ex uh, engineer I worked with at Epiphany, uh, George John, who built a company called Rocket Fuel um, into something worth market cap is in the billions. So it is possible. The question you need to ask and should have asked the day you took that check for the venture capital, from the venture capitals, and it's a great heuristic. Whenever you take money, here, there's two heuristics here. One is the minute you take money from someone, their business model has just become yours. It's a big idea. Never understood that. The second is, it's fair game to ask VCs who are about to fund you, what percentage of your founding CEOs are still running your companies that, are, that have a repeatable model? And it varies widely in the Valley from less than 20% to over 80% by partner, by firm. So I don't know if I asked or answered your question, but like, you know, I never knew any of this stuff. And it's pretty important if you're a founder who's kind of interested in scaling with your company and your VCs are going, oh no, we got, you know, 12 operating execs in the, in the can ready to go. Mm -hmm. Which as I said, might be the other half of your class, right? You might at least know them who's coming in. And it might be you actually want one in because that might not be your skill. Because part of this is actually having some self-awareness as a founder about what is your skill set and what did you enjoy to do? Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry for the long. No, that's okay. Irina, what? Maybe we have one more question here and then I'll turn to you to okay. wrap things up. Uh, thanks, Steve. Up, up here. Um, my name is Sandeep. I run an uh, automated uh, uh, a company that builds custom automated equipment for biotech, pharma, and device companies. Um, does, does this? The startup lean lean startup model apply to tangible products. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. So how does one go about uh, improving or sort of starting out with a sort of MVP and then building on that? It depends what your business is and what part you need some learning about. And I, I'm I'm a little confused. I, I I didn't have a specific example. I let's say you were making I don't know glow in the dark edible ice cream cone for example. I don't know. <laughs> So here, let me give you a, a specific example, semiconductors. You know, you would think, gee, that's a four-year design process or multi-year design process. Who the heck is going to, like, design in a microprocessor before you have any first silicon? In fact, it happens all the time. You figure out, you know, an MVP could be an emulator. It could be a software model. It could be a, you know, product spec, and you're designing for an existing socket or a new socket. Um, I did this with two semiconductor companies. Um, um, one called Zilog and the other called MIPS in the dark days in the past history of, uh, of the computer business where we were essentially, without using the words, um, building MVPs and, and selling, you know, um, and, and testing them as, as we went along. And we got, you know, tens of millions of dollars of orders without ever having any physical hardware. And sometimes we actually delivered the product too. Um, <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I mean, but doesn't that, so, the time becomes a huge issue there, right? Because, I mean, developing a next product, so getting customer feedback and then kind of making next product that kind of fits that. So, it, so I'll give you another example that no one actually thinks of that. The original iPods were all MVPs. Um, you know, if you remember uh, um, uh, iPods, when they first came out, you know, other people had them, and you know, maybe not as good, but they and they certainly didn't have the software. But everybody else had FM radios, and they had you know all other bells and whistles. And Jobs was great at being able to say no and figuring out what the minimum thing was. And my best friend was his VP of Hardware Engineering, John Rubenstein, and you know, it was always like, how do we get the smallest possible thing that we could get out quickly? And in fact, when you keep iterating MVPs 
and actually declaring them products. Anybody know what a Tesla is? Right? No. A Tesla is one, the Model S is one heck of an MVP. It, you know, it does one thing great, and then that is go from zero to 60 in 3.9 seconds and not use gasoline and have sufficient range. It doesn't have adaptive cruise control. It, you know, has mediocre handling if you came from a Porsche. But, you know, for what it does, and, and they have found the huge um, connection to product market fit, it's the world's most perfect MVP because you know the next versions of this are going to be better. Does that make sense or not? All right. Um, so, when we're... No, I, I was going to, hey, Steve, just um, as we close, if you could offer founders one piece of advice tonight, what would that be? Um, you know, I'm going to offer you some non-traditional advice that you um, um, probably don't hear in entrepreneurship stuff. Um, and and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, do eight startups in a couple decades and still have a family whose kids um, are now in their 20s, can't think of anything better to do than come back home and spend the holidays with their parents. And that's probably the hardest thing in your entrepreneurship career. To, and by the way, before I did that, I blew one marriage on it. When, when, my ass, when my previous wife asked me, what's more important, me or your work? And I had to actually think about it. Um, right, that's pretty cold, but true. Um, and, and, and for the second marriage, I was not confused. And, and so, for those of you who are about to embark on the startup world, it is all consuming. It will take up all hours of your day, and will, in fact, there will be no one to tell you to go home and spend time with your family. You're hearing it here. You don't get those years or time back. And it is possible, it is possible to live a balanced life. Um, and if, um, I, uh, I wrote a blog post, the only one I wrote with my wife, on how we did that. Um, and it's on my, I have a website called steveblank.com. And there's a section called Family and Culture. And uh, you might, I'm blanking on what the, what the name of the blog post was. Um, but um, I, I guess that's the best advice I could give you. Uh, the, the worst thing you want is to have been a successful, rich entrepreneur whose kids never knew who their father or mother was because you were so engaged. And I actually was lucky enough to have children later in their life when I watched that happen to people who I greatly admired at work, finding out their kids hated them because they were never home. And, and so I just want to give you that warning and also that good news is you can do both. It takes both a spouse who understands and it takes commitment from you to you know, be home and show. I never missed a major event of my kid's life. Um, and also the irony is when I was working for other people, you know, I was like traveling more than anything. And when I was finally CEO of a company, I realized I could send other people on those visits. I don't need to go to all of them. Um, and I made those trade-offs. And um, I don't think it made me a worse entrepreneur. It made me more thoughtful about the decisions I made. And as I said, uh, in hindsight, I was pretty happy I made them. So, I, okay, thank you. If you could join me in thanking Professor Len Lotus and Steve Blank tonight. Hey, go now. Steve is also the author he had mentioned. He referenced, you folks may know, but if not, um, the Startup Owner's Manual and Four Steps to the Epiphany. He also, which is credited for launching the Lean Startup Movement. Uh, in addition, he does offer um, online, Lean Launchpad online at Udacity. In case you guys want to check it out, and he mentioned his blog, steveblank.com. And how many of you are not from, uh, originally from this area? Anybody not? So there's something for just for laughs you might want to see. Go Google the secret history of Silicon Valley. Has anybody watched this? All right. Um, it is a story of how Silicon Valley started that almost none of you probably know, um, and you might find it amusing. Um, or just go to the website, stevelang.com. There's a tab on top called Secret History, and uh, it will keep you amused and entertained for a while. Um, Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We have much. a little something for you, both Steve and Len. Uh-oh. It's not a magic hat, but I... A little tangled up. Thanks, you guys. We really appreciate it. It's for you. Oh, Thank you very much. <laughs>